Okay, so we want to welcome those who are joining us live on Facebook, on YouTube. And uh, we're glad you're with us. If you want to give today, you can. Any day, you can at amanacf.org. If you're in the house, you can give in the box. There's a giving box in, in the foyer out that way. So I uh, want to let you know about that. All right, so let's open up our Bibles to John 13. And uh, looked up Robert and Mary Ann's last name today, and it means rich and powerful. I'm like, man, it also means curly. So Robert's rich and powerful, and his wife sometimes has curly hair. So that's kind of cool. I saw it, looked it up, because his last name is Raka. And I thought, man, Jesus said you can't call people that, you know. <laughs> I said, man, we're like, we got to kick Robert out of the church or something here. I said, let me, let me look up his last name. Well, let, let, me, let me tell you all a little word study here. Since I love to look this stuff up. Raka, there's an Aramaic Raka, and it's spelled R H. A-K-A. Now, I'm pretty sure Robert's not Middle Eastern, but there's a, there's a because his dad was a Sakalay fisherman. And so he can't be Middle Eastern. He, he's a Sakalay fisherman. He's probably more of the Anglo Raka, which there's a Germanic uh, Italian Raka, which is spelled R-A-C-A, close to your spelling. And, uh, and, and the Raka that is Arabic, which is the one Jesus was talking about, means Empty-headed numbskull. <laughs> I said, man, that's rough, man. It means senseless, you know. And, and I thought, man, that's rough. That's really bad. And I, I said, man, but, but I said, hang on. There's an Anglo one. There's a, there's a European rock car that I'm pretty sure his dad, who was a Sakalay fisherman, Cajun guy, is probably from that one. And I looked it up, and it means, it means curly. And it means, uh, so you can be empty-headed, numbskull, or you can be curly-headed, rich, and powerful. And, uh, and, and, and Raka is the curly, rich, and powerful guy. So you guys can say his last name all you want, okay? It's totally fine. <laughs> totally fine, okay? So, uh, and, it all, and it also comes from the word, it comes from the word Rico, which the Spanish, I studied Spanish. Spanish, that's a really good word. Rico, you got to roll the R, brother. But Rico means rich, powerful, wealthy. Right, so uh, brother, you're in good shape here. Nobody's going to hell for saying his last name. All right, because uh, Yvonne, you touched on that now. I thought, man, let me look that up. Let me see what's up with that. So, <laughs> wait, Raka, you're not getting excommunicated from the church, brother. Okay, so let, let's open up our Bibles to John 13. I entitled today's message, Surely Not I, Lord. Surely Not I, Lord. And uh, we're going to look at the mindset. At least initially, we want to look at the mindset of, of the 12. There was a mindset that 11 of them had, and there was a mindset that one of them had. And so uh, chapter 13, verse 20, that's what it says. It says, um, Jesus says, I tell you the truth, whoever accepts Anyone that I send accepts me. And whoever accepts me accepts the one who sent me. Now, I threw that in there because that's not the point of surely not I, Lord. But I threw that in there because I thought, what a great verse to touch on. Because first and foremost, we must understand that the Lord makes clear that if anyone, look, look at this, anyone that he sends is a direct result of accepting Christ or rejecting Christ, which is a direct result of accepting or rejecting the Father. See, Jesus is showing us this logistical hierarchy of the Father accurately and perfectly speaking through Christ, who in turn wants to accurately and perfectly speak that same word through the one that he sends. And then it is up to the hearer to either reject that word or to accept that word. And, and as a direct result, they will either directly accept or reject Christ himself. And directly accept or reject the Father himself. Now this is scripturally through and through. 
scripturally through and through. This is just another verse that validates that point that we've been saying for some time, that it is the Father who speaks and acts through the Son, and it is the Holy Spirit who waits for the word and action of the Son, which came from the Father. The Holy Spirit waits on, receives it from the Son, who received it from the Father, and as he receives it from the Son, he in turn works it through the believer. This is why Jesus said that if they accepted me, they will accept you. If they reject me, they will reject you. This is why we have to be very careful to pay attention to the words of the speaker, whomever it may be. Because um, if Christ is having his way through a given minister or even a non-minister who is really that's just formal language, we're all ministers, we're all priests. But we ought to pay attention. We need to pay attention to what we say to each other. Yvonne was talking about what we say. And he was talking about being careful what we say. And we need to be careful what we say concerning the things of God. And we do better to say nothing concerning the things of God lest it be the very words of God. For Peter says, speak as though you speak the very words of God. That doesn't mean we have to learn how to speak the words of God. It means we need to be slow to speak, quick to listen for the words of God. We need to become familiar with the voice of the shepherd. And it's very easy. It's less about becoming familiar with him, and it's more about silencing us, listening. And the, the words of Christ, like, uh, just like Yvonne was saying, we need to be careful of what we say, and we also need to be careful how we listen. Are we quick to reject something that sounds unfamiliar? Careful. Careful. Careful that when we think we reject man, we might be rejecting Christ. And what we receive from man, we might be receiving from Christ if the anointing is working through him, if Christ is working through him. So we learn to recognize the spirit of God from the spirit of the world. For those who speak from the viewpoint of the world concerning God or of this world and are of the spirit of the Antichrist, First John says, and those who speak from, not for, but from the viewpoint of God, or of God. And this is how we can tell those who are of God and those who are of the world. That's what 1 John says. He's saying, this is how you know whom you should hear and listen or hear and reject. This is how you can know the difference between the teaching of God versus the teaching for God. You see the difference? You learn to listen. Jesus says, he says here in chapter 13, verse 20, I tell you the truth, whoever accepts anyone I send accepts me. Whoever accepts me accepts the one who sent me. Now, after he said this, Jesus was troubled in spirit and testified, I tell you the truth. One of you is going to betray me. You know, what he said here is he said, one of you is going to misbehave. One of you is not going to behave like a Christian. One of you is about to operate, more than likely, concerning the things of God, concerning the desires of God. One of you is about to operate in the flesh. Now, he's not saying one of you is going to go out and commit adultery. He's not saying one of you is going to go out and abuse a child. He's not saying one of you is going to go rob a bank. I believe 
he's saying one of you is about to take the things of God into your own hands and operate from the flesh. Now, we know it was Judas. Now, I can't prove what I'm about to say, but there are a couple facts about Judas that he took money to turn Jesus in. Number two, he turned Jesus in, and then when they saw they were going to kill him, he turned the money back in. Now, those are facts. But what it appears to be is that he never intended for Jesus to die. He more than likely intended to force the hand of Jesus to establish his kingdom. See, he wanted to take the will of God into his own hands and into his own timing. See, he took the things of God, the concerns of God, into his own hands. Jesus says, that's betraying me. That's hardcore, man. That never gets mentioned. From coast to coast, you'll hear that very little. In fact, I once talked, not with these words, but the fruit of my message once was, take the things concerning God into your hands and show him how faithful you are. Do you really think God is going to trust something that came from dust with the glorious works of his hands? Are we that arrogant? Or should we humble ourselves and say, it would make sense that God would want to take an extremely weak, dust-filled vessel and reveal his glory through it so that no one would be confused as to who it came from. It'd be like picking a baseball. It'd be way, way bigger than this. But it's similar to picking a baseball team, playing against the Yankees, and picking a bunch of kindergartner kids and saying, if I can coach a bunch of kindergartner kids to beat, to beat the Yankees, everyone will know it's, it, it had to have been me. I'll get all the credit for that because everybody knows those kids can't beat those men. That's what God's doing. So before we get prideful and arrogant that we're something great for God, just consider you might be a kindergartner that he's working through to defeat men. It's not the other way around. In fact, Paul said we should take pride in our low position. You see, we can do nothing for God. The very attempt to do something for God is in some strange way, some foreign way to us, the very attempt to do something for God is actually a denial of Christ because we're denying him for doing something for God through us because we take it into our hands. It is betraying Jesus. One of you he says, is going to betray me. One of you is going to take the matters of God into your own hands. And you're going to betray me. Now, he didn't use the word deny me here as he did in another place. Because denying him would mean that Jesus wouldn't have had his way. No, Jesus had his way had his way. Many times, I'm going to tell you, and I know this, I know this statement is not very agreeable to some, but many times we deny him from having his way. I actually believe that the will of God is not always done. If it were, no one would be in hell right now. I don't think God, uh, well, we're not going to get into it. We're not going to get into it because it will get us off topic. But I'll just say every time I sin, 
I don't think God willed that to happen. So therefore, God's will is not always done. God's ultimate sovereign will, his preordained purposes are always done and they will be fulfilled. But there are things that Jesus wanted to do in his hometown that were not done. There are things that Jesus wants to fulfill and accomplish in the believer that are not done because the believer denies him the right, oftentimes by attempting to do them himself. And then there are times, in this case, where he was not denied from doing what he wanted to do, which was to go to the cross. But he was betrayed. He was actually betrayed. Not much difference. The only difference between the betrayal and the denial is that in one instance, he still accomplished what he wanted to accomplish. That was the betrayal. But in the denial, he does not accomplish what he wants to accomplish. Which I could show you scripturally, what he wants to accomplish is to speak the very words of the Father through the believer. And so he says, one of you is going to betray me. Oh, and by the way, you want to know the root of this betrayal? Leaning on his own understanding. Judas, in his understanding, Jesus could not go to the cross. How could he be king and establish Israel over Rome and all the nations? Which still hasn't happened. In will. How could he do that if he's dead? Peter thought the same thing, remember? Surely not, Lord. You can't go to the cross. Surely not. And what did Jesus tell Peter? Get behind me, Satan. Because you think with the thoughts of man and not the thoughts of God. Everybody forgets that part. All we remember is get behind me, Satan. That's what uh, two guys in a white shirt and a tie told me one time when I, when I made them leave my property. Well, made them leave y'all's property. See, people use that so flippantly, like, get behind me, Satan. Because I don't like what you're saying. No, 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 no. That's not what it means. It means when you, when you speak concerning the things of God from the viewpoint of man, that's Satan's desire because he knows it will always be inactive and powerless. You know what? When we do things for God and we say things for God instead of from God, you know what? It has an appearance of godliness, but it denies the power therein. You know what? It seems right to us, but that very thing that we're trying to do for God always ends in death. Look back at your track record. How many things did you start for God that you're still doing? How many things did we bring into birth for God, only to give birth to when it doesn't even exist anymore. Because it seemed right to man, but it ends to death. I didn't intend to talk about this, okay? But the things we do for God have an appearance of godliness, but they end in death. And they deny the power they're in. They deny. They deny Christ. They deny the power. It just connects. Judas and Peter, both in man's understanding, could not grasp Jesus going to the cross. And Jesus called leaning on that and operating for God from that, he called that satanic. That's satanic. So you can get a bunch of guys and black rose burning up a deer or something. And as satanic as that is, it's powerless. It doesn't do anything to God's kingdom. It, it's cold. It, it, it's totally inactive. It can't affect God's kingdom at all. It has no power. 
like all it does is like satanically empower those people. But it doesn't affect God's kingdom whatsoever. But you take that lukewarm position where a believer is taking the things of God into his own hand and calling it God and it being as inactive and lifeless as it is and calling that God is tarnishing a very good name. And it actually affects, denies, and betrays the kingdom of God. With good intentions, no doubt. With good intentions, I know. I got 20 years of that, so I'm not accusing anybody. I'm the chief of that. I got 20 years of that. So I, I, I'm, I'm speaking from experience here. But I was unaware. And you're not. You're not anymore. Miss Jeanette, you're not unaware of this. This church is not unaware of this understanding. We stand without excuse on this. We, we are not unaware. If you've been here a while, you stand without excuse on this. You, you, you have heard this, and if this, is, if this is rejected, be careful, be careful, be careful. Just consider that. Consider it. That's all I'm asking. I'm not judging. I'm saying consider. Just as I must consider as the teacher that I would be judged harshly for the words that I say, if I should call them Christ and they not be, not, not, not a pleasant thought. So the same is true for the hearer. If he should reject or accept the words, consider whom they may belong to. That's all I'm saying. We all need to consider. We stay humble. We, but the point I'm trying to make before the teaching today is that <laughs> one of us, he says, and not one of us, but there's a tendency. Is what he's saying. There's a tendency here to betray Jesus by taking the things of God into the hands of flesh. Whew. That's strong, man. Oh, uh, so I'm just looking at my notes. It says John 13, 20 through 25. Let's go to 21. After he had said this, Jesus was troubled in spirit. Oh, yeah, we read this. I'll tell you the truth. One of you is going to betray me. Now, his disciples stared at one another at a loss to which of them he meant. So, did, did you catch it? One of you, one of you is going to betray me. And they looked straight at flesh. They looked at one another. Oh, flesh always looks to flesh. The whole point of the message that we teach is that we should look to Christ. At flesh is shortcoming, it might shortcoming. You know, the word flesh is confusing because you always think like a guy with a knife or a black suit breaking in a house, killing somebody. Self. 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 Self looks to self and to others for the things of God. I'm sinning. Let me look inward. I'm not producing enough fruit. Let me look inward. No, we don't look inward. We look to Christ. We look to Christ. One of you is going to betray me. They look straight at each other. Why didn't they look at Christ? But old John, the one that wrote so in-depth, the book of 1 John, so in-depth of what it meant to abide in Christ. And as you keep reading this, you know, you'll, you'll see some of them said, surely not I, Lord. Well, where would they get that from? They looked inward. Flesh appraises flesh. 
flesh appraises flesh. Flesh appraises flesh from the viewpoint of flesh. I tell you now that Jesus Christ himself can come stand here, maybe not look like the one on the chosen, maybe look, maybe a short fat man with a funny beard or with curly red hair or something and, and just come here and speak in the ver those very words of Christ would be rejected by those who appraise flesh from the viewpoint of flesh. Surely not I, Lord, is simply flesh looking inward and saying, I know my track record and I would never do that. But John, it's almost as though John said, surely I'll do that. Because as holy as I may be, as much as I may know Jesus, a third of me is still flesh. And that third of me that is still flesh is no better than any other vile sinner who's never met Christ. His flesh is no worse than my flesh. You got to get that. You got to go ahead and own that. Because if your flesh is better than a vile sinner who's never known Christ, if your flesh is better than his flesh, then you need God a little bit less because of your greatness. Something ain't right with that. When Jesus said, apart from me, you can do nothing, he's talking to the flesh of the man. He's talking to the self of man. He's talking to the part that is secondary important. He's talking to... He's talking to the flesh of man. He's talking to the part of you that is accursed. Like that part of you is going to die. You do know that that part of you is not going to resurrect. That's not the resurrected part. There's a glorified body that will resurrect. 1 Corinthians 15. Some will have different splendor, just as the sun has one splendor, the moon another, and the stars another. So will it be with the resurrected body. Now I'm getting into my teaching. I kept having a feeling some of this stuff would come up. There's a part of you that from time to time, God will heal it. We shouldn't declare him to do so because that part's cursed. I'm just saying. Why am I getting into this? Now I'm in the heart of the charismatic country right here, man. This is where my roots are from. And I'm going to tell you, we declare God to heal a cursed part of us. obligate him to and we believe that he's going to do it or do we hope he's going to do it <clears throat> well it gets upsetting huh I know I know but it also gets real confusing if we don't address it because a lot of people die that we love that were faithful Paul wrote Galatians with big letters because his eyes just weren't healed. Timothy had that hurt stomach and he had to deal with that medicinally, you know? And so it, 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 it's, why are we getting into this? I don't want to get into this. I want to talk about abiding. <clears throat> Understand that God has purposes for your body. He has kingdom purposes that he wants to accomplish through your body, and therefore he may heal your body to prolong you, but it's for the kingdom purposes, not because he owes you a healing in your body. Quit telling him that. Quit demanding that. Quit being entitled. 
I'm not talking to anybody specifically. I'm talking to that wall. <laughs> we got to put like a big head on the wall. You know what a big head is? James, you know what a big head is. You got some at your house. Some it's probably got like a, a fat head. Fat head. Like, we got to put like a Drew Brees fat head back there, and I'll just preach at Drew Brees all the time. I'm not really preaching to Drew Brees. I don't want to get sued or anything, but <laughs> Drew Brees is like, I'm going to get all 12 of your dollars, you know. <laughs> At least I get to meet him. Listen, God doesn't, he, he, if he heals your body, it's because he has kingdom purposes. It's always about the kingdom purpose. He'll heal the body. But the body it's going to die, man. It's not the blessed part. It's not the blessed part. God does bless it. But it's for kingdom purposes. It's, it's, it's going to, it's like, it's going to die. That's what, you know what? The one thing God pro pro did promise you about your body, I'll give you that. He gave you one promise. It's going to die. That's what he said. That's what he said. It's going to die. Now, I don't know when. For me, it's probably about 130 years from now. <laughs> but here's the thing. If it is, it's because God has 130 more years of kingdom purposes to do through this thing. And if it's 130 minutes from now, God forbid, then he's got 130 more minutes of kingdom purposes to accomplish through this thing. That's his business. And for me to try to understand all that just might be taking kingdom matters into the hands of flesh, into the hands of human understanding. Which, be careful. Now, surely not idle is, they, they, they look to each other and they say, surely not idle. But John the Beloved, I mean, y'all want to read it first before I tell you about it? Look. <coughs> his disciples stared at one another. I wish it said his disciples stared straight at Christ and said, Lord, help us. Because my flesh is capable of doing exactly what you said. Lord, lest you work in me, that will happen to me. What if they would stare at him and say, Lord, unless you empower me, that's exactly what I'm going to end up doing. What if they had said that? That would have been incredible. But he says, one of them, the disciple whom Jesus loved, was reclining. This is, this is a picture of abiding. He was resting, leaning, laying. You know the Isaiah scripture, uh, he whose mind is steadfast on him is at peace. Thank you. We got a new church scribe, Jaden. Jaden, you're fired, bro. Heather got you. She got you, bro. He will keep it perfect peace, he whose mind is steadfast on him. That word steadfast means lean, lay, rest, support itself. And it says because he trusts him. This is, this is that picture. John is steadfast. He's leaning, laying, resting, su supported by Christ. And just look at the details of this. It says, he was reclining next to him. He was leaning on Christ. He was near him. There was a closeness to Christ. There was an awareness of Christ. <clears throat> Simon Peter motioned to this disciple. See, he, Peter, he's still kind of missing it here. It's like saying, Pastor Jason, what must I do? I know that's the church model, but it's really not accurate. <laughs> because Pastor Jason's going to say, turn to Christ. Let's turn to Christ together. Let's wait on the Lord. Let's lean on him. And let's do nothing. Let's be still. Give him space. 
create this movement here. You see? That's what John's doing. But, but Peter's saying, hey, look, um, go, go find out the pastor. Go find out some people. Hey, John, I'm in the inner circle, but you're, you're the lead disciple. You're the pastor. He's like, I'm on staff, but you're the pastor. Go find out from God what he wants from you. That's the tendency of humans. That's what they told Moses. We don't want to hear from God. You go up the mountain, find out what he says, and come back to us. And Peter's saying, hey, John, find out what he's talking about. You think Jesus wants to have a relationship with Peter through John? You think Jesus wants to have a relationship with you through the pastor? Way too much emphasis on pastors. Far too much, far too little emphasis on the master. Too much on the pastor, too little on the master. Not here, though. Ask Mr. James. I can clean a good floor. I can clean a good floor. Ask Miss Heather. I can clean a good floor. Huh, Heather? Shout it out, girl. I'm a good janitor, and I'm a good pastor because I point you to Christ, not because I have all the answers, but I point you to the one who does. I hope you all come one day and say, where's Pastor Jason? We don't see him, and somebody stands up and say, well, he's hidden in Christ. That, that's, that's what I want, and I really want what I really want, what I really want is for people to lean on Christ so much that it becomes very obvious that they have surpassed the pastor. That's what I really desire. Because when the pastor becomes the least in the church, he's become the greatest pastor in town. But as long as the pastor is the greatest in the church, he's extremely ineffective. And that's fact. Because if he remains the greatest in the church, that means no one's getting pointed to Christ. Because when man gets pointed to Christ, and Christ has his way through man, he surpasses any position of man. Now, the pastor ought to surpass where the pastor is, too, if Christ has his way. Where's all this coming from? Good night. I have an agenda here, man. I'm trying to teach this thing. I can't do it. There's so much I want to say. There's so much I want to say. Mr. Wayne, I want to read those Philippians, that Philippians 2.13, Philippians 3.10, Philippians 3.20. I want to go to Isaiah 30, 15 through 19. I want to go to Psalm 132, 7 through 9, 13 through 16. I really want to talk about abiding in John 15, 1 through 5. I was hoping to read the opening verse. John 13, 20 through 25, but we've only got two verses. <laughs> At least we got some preaching material stored away. <laughs> That'll never get used, probably. Man, Mr. Wayne had some awesome. I, th yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Mr. Wayne had some awesome. Man, he's talking about. Christ accomplishing the purposes that he created. I'm like, man, I'm, I'm, on Wednesday night, late at night, he's preaching that stuff. I'm, I'm, I'm sitting there in my notes, son. I'm going to talk about that. That's good. Sorry, but I told Mr. Wayne, I said, man, you and me, I met him at Lowe's. We, was, we were on the trash can aisle. And I said, we ain't talking trash no more, bro. <laughs> we are on to something now, bro. We're on to so we put a lid on that trash. He was helping me find a lid to fit it. What's that? Yeah, he was having his way. He was helping me find a lid that fit the trash can. It was really confusing. And he and he's like, it don't take much for that. And then the Lord said, Look. The Lord said, We're putting a lid on that trash talk. Now y'all get in church, boys. 
Okay. We're going to get to this, I'm telling you, man. Man, John was reclining next to him. Simon Peter most, yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah, Simon's like, look, I want to have a relationship with Jesus, said John. <laughs> Ask him, John, which one is he talking about? John falls for it. He's like, he should have said, Peter, you ask him, bro. I'm abiding in Christ. I don't even care who he's talking about. I only feel secure in him. See, Peter's just like all of us. He's like, I need to find out if I have this issue or not. See, this is what Peter's saying. If I don't have this issue, I don't need to, I don't need to lean on Christ. That's what he's really saying. There it was. That's what you needed to hear, huh? If, I, if this issue doesn't concern me, I don't need to lean on Christ. And John's saying, you know what? I'm not sure if it's me or not, but I'm going to lean on Christ. Because if I lean on Christ, everything that does concern me, he'll work through me for. And everything that doesn't, I don't need to concern myself with. I don't need to take the treasure of Christ and try to manage it in my hands. Rather, why don't I just lean on the treasure of God, which is Christ? See, Jesus is the treasure. I don't want to be a prodigal son. I don't want to be a prodigal son that says, Father, give me Jesus, the treasure, and I'll know how to manage the things of Christ with my hands. That's the picture of the prodigal son. It wasn't really about prostitution and drunkenness. and We don't condone those things. It's not the root issue of the prodigal son. The root issue of the prodigal son is that he took the treasure from the father and thought he knew best how to manage it. And he squandered it. Have you figured out yet that Jesus is the treasure of the father? And you can't take the things of Christ in your hands and manage it. Trust me, I tried to pastor a church like that. End up in all kind of strife. I'm fortunate to be standing before you today. Only by the resurrected life of Christ do I stand before you today. So I take nothing for granted. But I tell you that we cannot take the things of Christ and manage them in our own hands. That if we found ourselves there, there is a celebration that the Father longs to hold for you. It is not too late to say, I'm going back to the Father with this Christ in my hand saying I cannot manage the things of Christ. And he will butcher the fattened calf and throw a robe around you and celebrate. And others will say, that's not even fair he's celebrating so much. He longs to do it. He knows the tendency of man. He knows how Peter is. Peter's like, find out if this is my issue, John. And if it is, then I'll lean on Christ too. And if it's not, then I won't. Because my flesh never wants to lean on Christ. It's more comfortable figuring it out myself. It's more comfortable thinking I can manage Christ myself than to lean on Christ. But, oh, Peter found out, and so did John. <coughs> Sorry about that. So did many, and so have I. We have found out. And you only find out through the experiential knowledge of Jesus that Paul so often spoke of, and Jesus spoke of, and John spoke of. <clears throat> As Christ has his way through the believer enough times, the believer becomes fully convinced that, uh-uh. I am so comfortable not managing the things of Christ because he is very, very perfect at it. And so John, John just says this. He says, you know what? Peter, it's as though, it's as though he told Peter, Peter this, but he didn't. It's as though he did. It's as though he said, Peter, you figure out mentally if that concerns you. 
You go ahead and wrap your understanding. Peter, you go ahead and wrap your understanding all around me if that concerns you or not. You know what I'm going to do, Peter? I'm going to wrap my understanding as close to the heart of Jesus as possible and put my head right up against it. And I'm just going to have a climax right there. You figure it out. You lean on your understanding, Peter. And I'm going to lean on the heart of Christ. You lean on your understanding concerning the things of God. And I'm going to lean on the heart of Christ concerning the things of God. Sorry, Jaden, I'm going to spoil this. You lean on the knowledge of good and evil. And I'm going to lean on the tree of life, which they never ate from. You know why Adam and Eve, did you know? Sorry, Jaden, this is your teaching. Don't take it from me. Did you know? Did you know that Adam and Eve could have eaten from the tree of life? Why didn't they? Because they thought they had life. Did you know that you could lean on Christ? Why don't you? Because you already have Christ. Same cut. I already have Christ. I was saved in 1998. I was baptized and filled with the Holy Ghost in 1999. I spoke in tongues in 2000. I already have Christ. See, I don't desperately lean on Christ because I already have Christ. Why would I eat from the tree of life? I already have eternal life. But woe did they know that the life they had was only, it, it, it wasn't the life of Christ. It was just life. They have a relationship with God broken because they they had to lean on their knowledge, on their understanding of the things of God, good and evil. They had to get that. They didn't need the life. They needed to know more about God. They wanted to take into their own hands a way to become more like God. Today, we have Christ in us, it's, a, it's like the tree of life. But if we're not careful, we'll find ourselves settling to just have Christ and never leaning on him for the life of Christ. We'll assume we have the life of Christ, but yet only have Christ. We can have the tree of life and never eat from it. We can have Christ and never eat from him because we're settling to know more about him. We'll teach classes on more information about him, and yet never, it's it, there's your knowledge, but never encourage each other to lean on him and to receive the life of him. And there's a tree of life sitting there full of fruit, untouched. And by the way, when they, when they, when they instead of eating from the tree of life, they want to know more about God so as to become more like God. They might have even thought, well, if that don't work, we're going to leave from the tree of life. That put a sword in front of the tree of life and cut it off. We begin to lean on human understanding concerning the things of God, and the life of Christ will be blocked off, veiled. Because only in Christ, only in that tree of life, is the veil removed. I know it's deep. I'm sorry. I'm, I'm not sorry. I'm not sorry. I know it's deep. I empathize. I know it's hard. I know it's a hard teaching. I know. But it's a true teaching. We're going to end with this, Kim. If you, if you are like Peter, and we are, I am oftentimes like Peter. I want to understand the things of God so that I might know what concerns me and what doesn't concern me because ultimately deep inside my flesh wants to plan not to lean on Christ. John, find out what I need to lean on him for and what I don't need to lean on. John's like, look, dude, be quiet, Peter. I'm just leaning on him for everything. He's like, I believe what he said in John 15, Peter. Well, they didn't have 15 back then, but you know what I mean. I believe what he said in my book that I wrote, Peter. 
chapter 15. Check it, man. This is John saying. It's like, I wrote it. He's saying, no, he didn't write it till later, but anyway, he's saying, I believe what Jesus said, Peter, that I can do nothing apart from him. Peter, you believe if it doesn't concern you, then you can do something that you can prevent betraying him. And Peter, I don't believe that I can prevent even from betraying him. So I'm going to just lean on him for everything. I believe that when he said you can do nothing apart from me, that meant I can do nothing spiritually good apart from him. So I'm just going to lean on him for the opposite of nothing, everything. Not just for the things that I think I can't do for him, assuming I can do something for him when he said I could do nothing for him. What he's saying is your flesh is so dead and ineffective if anything spiritually good happens in you, it's either a counterfeit of the flesh or it's the life of Christ. And John's like, I'm going to get my head, my understanding, as close to his heart and just abide there. And Peter's like, he's still trying to wrap his head around it all. That's the picture. That's the picture. Let's stand up and pray. I know, I know we said a lot. A little bit different message. That's Lord, we love you and we thank you, God, that we can lean on you. We can do nothing apart from you. Anything that we think that we can do for you, Lord, is a counterfeit. We just soon surrender, Lord. And like John did, just recline on you with our head on your heart, on your chest. And say, I'll rest. And I'll wait for you to orchestrate all kingdom activity. I speak to you, church, truthfully when I say he is faithful to orchestrate kingdom activity if, if, if we give him space. Your stillness is his space. He fills space so much that he fills cups to overflowing. Your soul is his vessel. And if you will give him space there by being still, he will fill it to overflowing and it will be with the life of Christ. It won't be knowledge about Christ. It will be from the tree of life. It will be the life of Christ overflowing. This is the life that he came to give abundantly. <clears throat> These words... I believe are from God. I bless you with that statement. In Jesus' name. Love you guys. Amen.